first let me say that I'm very honored to, to be here uh, among these uh, distinguished group of, of uh, people. And it has been also quite a day uh, with this morning, morning also with the, the audience, with uh, His Holiness the, the Pope. And, uh, and uh, this session is about the, the, the COP24 in Katowice and also the, the, the build up towards Katowice, which is very important. And of course, what we also do afterwards. And let me also fir first say that, uh, as many speakers have also pointed out, we are in an extreme hurry. There's no doubt. And uh, there's, we have to do much more, way faster than has been uh, thought earlier. And in Katowice, the most important thing, I think there's two things about Katowice. The most important, as a follow-up in the, the Paris Agreement, is that we get the rule book in Katowice right. That is that you get one rule book that is the same for all countries in, uh, in the world, and it has the enough of transparency so that it can be a base for countries to increase their commitments in the years ahead. That is the most important thing about Katowice, and we cannot fail on that. The other part is that you have the Talanoa dialogue that Fiji started last year, and it's the dialogue in countries, among countries, on, on increasing our commitments and what we give, what we, the indices we give to the UN in 2020. And in Katowice, and what we also, uh, Norway works with, with other countries, is that we can bring together enough countries that can come out of Katowice with a convincing voice that we have the will to increase our commitments and to come out with enough will so that the rest of the world also believes that we will commit more than what we have in the Paris Agreement. So that businesses start to, start to notice and they start to act accordingly. That will have an effect, it will have an effect with organizations, with local, uh, local um, uh, governments, but also those who make investments in the future. That is the most Im important. And of course, it's a bottom-up, uh, must always remember that Paris Agreement is a bottom-up agreement, so that it is about, governments are definitely the most important. That's where the responsibility are. But still, you must mobilize from the individual to organizations, to uh, businesses, all the way to local governments, and also faith communities that we have here. That is essential in the years ahead. And the California summit will be part of that. But we must act now. Uh, and for me, uh, I will talk more on what we do also internationally, but it's uh, that I have to, in Norway, we must do our homework. And we do a, a lot. I have examples. I mean, in, in electric cars, the sales in Norway now is more than 25%, as an example for the rest of the world. And by 2025, uh, there are to, all sales from new cars are to be uh, zero emission. That is the goal, and it's achievable. And there's a lot also happening within, within fishing, the electric car ferries, and so on, and so on. And we have something, we have also a, a commission looking at the, the climate risk of the whole country that, they're giving, that will give away their assessment in December this year. Uh, that is a, a, it's not a start of a discussion, for climate risk is something that we discussed for a long time. But in Norway, it's a particular discussion, because it's one thing is about the risk because of climate change and, a, a, and the weather changes and everything that comes with that. But for us, being an oil and gas dependent country is also a, a risk about the changes. Uh, when climate action comes, we have to change our entire economy. So transition is a part of the, the debate and transition. Uh, and then you come to a just transition because this can, uh, and with Poland, it's interesting that having the COP in Poland with their coal dependency, uh, a just transition is definitely also a, a, a something that, that we have to think about. How do you bring unions along? How do you bring those that today are the problem onto a different course where you become part of the solution? And, and this, you cannot just wait until you must make a change. You have to have a strategy to create that change. So that's also part of it. But in my final uh, statement, I would like to say a little bit more of a, of a project that Norway has. Because during the Bali climate change negotiations in 2007, we launched uh, what was to become the government of Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative. 
And since that, for 10 years, we have spent about 5 uh, billion uh, US dollars on this project with several uh, countries that we cooperate with internationally. And tropical forests, they regulate regional and global weather patterns. They provide billions of people with the necessities of life, and they house the greatest diversity of living organisms on Earth. They're part of humanity's shared natural, cultural, and spiritual heritage. And destruction of rainforests is rampant and, ac and accelerating. In many ways, they are catastrophic, how they are today. New data shows that loss of tree cover equivalent to the area of France, Germany, and the UK combined in the last decade. Uh, and recent research suggests that the protection, restoration, and sustainable management of forests could offer up to one-third of the emission reductions needing, needed to meet our climate goals. So that is also where a lot of the solutions are. You have to stop deforestation, but also the solution for mitigation is also there. Uh, we have been working across sectors to assemble a multi-stakeholder coalition of governments, indigenous peoples, NGO, business and civil society partners that are committed to ending tropical deforestation. But policy discussions at the international level and in major rainforest countries have been lacking a moral voice over the issue. There's an urgent need to bring a moral, ethical and spiritual dimension more strongly to bear in global efforts to end tropical deforestation. And that is why we, in 2017, launched a new initiative called the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. The idea for this initiative came out of a meeting here at the Vatican in November of 2016. Um, uh, and it was deeply inspired by Laudato Si. The Interfaith Rainforest Initiative is being developed as an international faith-based movement to protect rainforests and those that serve as their guardians. Uh, it, is a, it is a shared platform for the world's religions to unite in their efforts to end deforestation and to work within their respective faith tra uh, traditions. Uh, and the initiative has the highest levels of support from both uh, the government of Norway and also the United Nations system, as we heard earlier today. Now, I'm sorry that I have to go and make an interview, so I have to make a little short stop for this. Uh, but we really, from the inception of this initiative, uh, it has taken its inspiration and theory of change from the call to action issued in Laudato Si, and the strong leadership of Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. And we hope to work in close partnership with the Vatican and the Holy Father on this effort, and to ensure consistency with rollout of Laudato Si's efforts across the globe. And this is much more. One is, to, one is to combat climate change. The other is to, to fight for biodiversity. But the third one is also about indigenous rights. It's about human rights. Uh, and it's about empowerment and also combating and alleviating poverty. So this is really an initiative that we have come here to emphasize and, and try to, to, to bring on a broader, uh, broader um, uh, cooperation also with the Vatican on that and the other phase. Then I must say thank you, and I will be out for five minutes, and I'll be back, but thank you. Thank you.